go to vote. They've already done that given the time difference. Um, and so we were looking at some of the ways that faith-based groups and others could prevent violence from happening again. We went to the newest country in the whole entire world, South Sudan, is also the poorest country in the entire world. And one of the fascinating things, even in that context, we went to a refugee camp, folks who had left Sudan, crossed the border, perhaps not what they had intended, but the violence and persecution led them to, to flee. And even in those refugee camps, as I've seen in other refugee camps in Africa and elsewhere, they had a market. They had a little box with little plastic baggies of stuff you could buy. So I bought uh, some cardamom seeds. Why? Because that's what they had for sale. But even in the midst of that poverty and desperation, people still need to eat. And they still want to be able to provide for their families. To see that and witness that gave me hope. And then to conclude the trip in Rwanda where just 18 years ago the genocide had happened and devastated the country. And to see the reconstruction that had taken place, to see the amazing progress that was made to the point of going up and visiting a church-based effort, caring for folks with AIDS, training church volunteers to go and care for families so that they made sure they were getting their medicine, so that they made sure that they were growing a garden and had some of the best techniques and to see some of that. We went to visit this one woman and her family and she was growing a kitchen garden in her little patch of dirt. Rwanda is one of the most densely populated places in the world. Very different from western Kansas, let's say. And the techniques that she had learned not only were feeding her own family, but she was able to sell the excess fruits and vegetables that she grew to pay for the university fees for her son. How fabulous an example of what, in this case, as in many other cases, helping a woman could do, who was that small scale farmer who needed that kind of technical guidance. She knew how to farm, but, oh, here's what you could do to double your yield. Here are the seeds that would help you better. Here's the water conservation techniques that would work. Absolutely amazing. And then finally, just in sort of my background, as Mary alluded to, uh, about 20 years ago, as someone fresh out of undergraduate, I had moved to DC and started working with a member of Congress who really cared about hunger. It was from Dayton, Ohio, and he had been touched by going to Ethiopia as the first congressman to go there uh, during their great famine when a million people died. And for him, he saw two dozen kids die in the space of a couple hours. And he came back a changed man and said, if I'm going to use my position of power, I want to use it for them. I got to learn with him. I got to work with him. He was my role model and mentor. And that led to working with him on Capitol Hill and seeing poverty and hunger policy being made. And uh, Then he got appointed as a Democrat by President Bush to be our US ambassador to the UN's World Food Program and the Food and Agriculture Organization. And he dragged me kicking and screaming with him to Rome, Italy. <laughs> Ow, okay, I'm going. <laughs> My, this is pretty cool. My wife and I arrived two weeks before our first anniversary, so it's an extended honeymoon living a few years in Rome. And it was perfect for her. She got a job consulting with the World Food Program because she had gone to the Peace Corps after college, became a community health worker. Why? Because she had taken one nutrition class in undergrad, and she knew CPR. The Peace Corps said, great, you can be a community work. But that set her down her path. So then she worked with Haitian refugees in Guantanamo Bay when it was a prison of different sorts. Then she talked with a number of folks, much like I'm sure some of the, the, you students have done here, and she found out that a master's in public health was probably the best way that she could go. 
And so she got that, and then she did some research with a professor in, back in West Africa where she had been assigned, and then when she graduated, got a job with World Vision and worked in the middle of the Saharan desert for a couple years, and that set her trajectory. Then she worked with CARE, and then with AID, and then finally with the World Food Program, and now uh, her job is caring for two hungry children, and she does a fabulous job. When I was a senior, I took a class on overcoming global hunger. And I remember learning the statistic that 40,000 people died every day from malnutrition and preventable disease, most of them kids. And I said, I want to do something about that. And I wish I could claim credit, but in those 20 plus years, that number has come down from 40,000 a day to 25,000 to 24,000. Now it's an even creeped lower. That's still more than any other killer in the world. God bless you. More than AIDS, more than tuberculosis, more than malaria combined. I wanted to do something with my life, and I figured that that was the way. All of you are here over the course of this weekend and even stuck through till Monday morning because you feel some of that same tug. To the people of poor nations, we pledge to work alongside you to make your farms flourish and let clean waters flow, to nourish starved bodies and feed hungry minds. Four years ago, President Obama said that line in his first inaugural address. Wow. That set in process what I wanted to share with you this morning. That one line in one speech by a leader set in motion a whole array of activities that still continue to this day. So I wanted to talk a little about Feed the Future from a dream to reality. So President Obama makes that speech. One line in that speech, my daughter was on my shoulders. We were among the million or so folks there. My wife had our then infant son strapped to her chest in one of those baby Bjorns nursed him and changed a diaper all in that line, waiting to get in. But that one line in a speech set the wheels of government in motion. But it wasn't in a vacuum. So before that speech, before he had even been elected, a number of the non-governmental organizations or NGOs had come together to say, what can we do to lay the groundwork for what would really make a difference in fighting global hunger. So CARE and World Vision and Catholic Relief Services and Feed the Hungry and a whole bunch of other folks, including the organization I was working with, came together under the leadership of this guy who I used to work with, former ambassador and congressman Tony Hall, to get on the same page. And so they, they issued this roadmap to end global hunger, set out all of the things that they felt would be in, involved if we were to really make a difference in hunger, if we were to meet that first millennium development goal of cutting hunger in half by 2015, which is now just a couple years away. So that foundation existed because all of the folks who were doing it who were running the programs, who were feeding folks in those refugee camps, who had run the small-scale agriculture programs. They had come together and their collective wisdom was, here's what it'll take. Then you get the folks from the US Agency for International Development, AID, and the folks from the organization I joined, joined the US Department of Agriculture and the State Department, and, and all of them started having those kind of conversations. And out of that was born this vision of Feed the Future. Um, Caleb's going to bring this up to just give you a sense 
Um, and you've already heard a little about it, but one of the places to go and find out more is feedthefuture.gov. And you got what's new, you got the featured, you got to get involved, you got all of the, the information of what the government has compiled. Just a little history, some results, and the future goals, and how you plug in, and then happy to do some questions. So, a few months after he was sworn in as our 44th president, President Obama goes to this G8 gathering, the group of eight of the wealthiest nations in the world. And that year, in 2009, it was in L'Aquila, Italy, outside of Rome. The town had been devastated by an earthquake, so the prime minister wanted all the world leaders to go there and see how they were rebuilding. And President Obama put global hunger and agricultural development on the agenda. Made a pledge that if the world would come together, the U.S. would lead. And that's often what it takes for some action. Not always, we're not the only player out there, but in this case, that's what it took. The disinvestment in agricultural research and development had been pretty substantial. And so this was saying, the best way to prove